Please use the microphone. <laughs> Hereby, I open this academic ceremony in which Alexander Baker will defend the academic thesis, Dancing on the Shoulders of Giants, an action inquiry into the navigation of organizational transformation for sustainability in the university. May I invite you to present a summary of your study and the conclusions of your thesis. Thank you, Prorector. Welcome, friends, colleagues, family. In the next 15 minutes, I will present my PhD thesis, which the Prorector has kindly already entitled for me. Uh, I will first start with the structure of today's presentation, which resembles that of the thesis. Part one is understanding the phenomenon that I researched, transformation for sustainability within the university as an organization. We will proceed through the introduction, methodology, action research, and case study approach. I will then try and give a brief synopsis of the case studies, how I analyze them, a synopsis with some findings and transformative signatures, and I'll proceed into the final part, which involves summarizing my research into Maastricht University as an insider case, and I will finish with the discussion. To introduce, the research problem can be summarized in terms of this statement that universities are indeed well positioned to identify pathways of transformation towards sustainability, given their consideration of long-term sustainability outcomes. What there is consensus on, and what we do know, is that complex, dynamic, and uncertain challenges are increasing, and universities no doubt contribute towards solving these. But they seem to be a limited understanding as to how and at what scale is necessary for them to transform. They seem to lack tangible systemic rubrics with which to do so, and despite being organizations of learning, they struggle to set up structures to promote their own organizational learning. The imperatives can be summarized in terms of a simple and bold statement that goes as such. Radical human transformation of the ecosphere has both necessitated and threatened an equally radical transformation of organized human life. And universities are challenged to provide adaptations to that. The objectives, therefore, were to unearth behavioral qualities and traits of systemic change in the teams, units, and individuals working on sustainability within the university. I performed a transdisciplinary investigation 
in order to reconcile the dialectics of sustainability as observed and presented on websites and reports and as lived and practiced inside the organization itself. The research questions therefore proceeded in terms of how universities can and do navigate their transformations, not just as institutions, but as the social units within them. What are the core elements that are required? What informative approaches exist? And what rubrics and competencies and patterns could potentially be unearthed from the case studies? I decided to weave together mixed methods in a qualitative research strategy of investigative triangulation in a within case study. And what does that mean? That means I converge different sources of information, interviews, interviews, documents on websites, organizational mapping and journaling. And this was based on the precedents that existed on the literature, that any study of organizational processes and actors that drive transformation towards sustainability requires careful attention to the connection of surface and deep structure. There was also a lack of small n embedded research in the literature. There are many large n remote survey studies that already exist. And that is why I proceeded the way I did. In the next study, in the next slide, you can see this diagram which presents my research approach. In order to provide some brevity, I will give a brief overview of how it proceeded and then I'll move into the case studies. In the first phase, we focused on what exactly organizational transformations were for sustainability, a conceptual review. In the second phase, I performed these embedded insider case studies. And the third phase focused on UM and performing interventions there all the while whilst reporting back to teams in co-inquiry with my co-researchers back here at the Green Office and at Maastricht Sustainability Institute. Moving forward, the outcome of that process, as I just mentioned, of the conceptual synthesis was an analytical framework, which through four rounds of testing at each case study eventually became the diagnostic tool of systemic rubrics through data saturation and through multiple modes of refining each of the case uh, analytics. Moving forward, a case study synopsis. How did I do the case studies? I spent four to five weeks at each site. There were 11 to 15 interviews per case. As I mentioned earlier, data sources focused on documents and they were pro proportional to organizational size and complexity, not to mention the transcripts as well. I created, based on Ian Day's guide to qualitative data analysis, combined with experimenting with the data sets, an equation with which to qualify relationships and proportionally show the weight of the evidence behind each code. This is presented at the bottom of the slide. I will begin with my first case, Lofana University Lüneburg. Despite its small size, it is known in Germany and throughout Europe for its approach to sustainability, innovation and social impact. Its adoption of sustainability into its strategy became its niche with which it could compete with larger regional higher education institutions. These initiatives coalesced in high levels leadership support and the formalization of a whole faculty of sustainability, which then provided a platform with which the other faculties and units in the university could liaise. Arizona State University, by contrast, is a large public research university in the United States of America. It performed a top-down redesign of its institutional model driven by a highly ambitious president and his team. And it seemed to behave more as a unified autonomous unit rather than separate faculties. As you can see in the center of the slide, it even has design principles with which the community came up with how it could define what kind of university it was going to be. You, ASU's transformation was run like a campus-sized experiment and that's what I would like to highlight from that slide. At HKUST, Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, the highlights were as such, they were, they were a part of a Hong Kong sustainable campus consortium with which they shared best practices. There was also a, a sustainability unit, which was part of the Department of Environmental Sciences, and that showed effective internal governance for sustainability, as well as student and staff driven competencies in sustainability. HKUC was also set up in 1992 to contribute to the regional social and economic development of the region explicitly. I will show you the products of how I applied the ID tool, which I presented earlier. So as you can see, each of the assets are weighted according to that equation visually, and you can see pathways in different colors. 
These are the action strategies of how the teams and units at my case universities navigated the transformation. The visualization rep therefore represents a unique signature of transformation for sustainability. This is Arizona State Universities, and this is HKUSTs. You can therefore say that these diagrams represent a way of demonstrating socio-equal, organizational, and behavioral qualities and characteristics implicit in the systemic change that was navigated. In the synthesis of the case studies, I drew, drew these three case studies together into common patterns and shared qualities, which I won't go into for the sake of brevity. These were later applied at Maastricht University. This slide shows how the inquiry proceeded at Maastricht University. In 2010, the first Green Office was approved. And that was a first because now there are dozens throughout Europe and internationally. In 2012, Maastricht University won an award as the Dutch university with the most transparent sustainability efforts. In, in late 2013, this inquiry began and we started various interventions. A communications strategy project was, a, was a, attempted. In 2015, we focused on the governance. We also produced a reporting framework. In 2016, we tried to work in parallel with an external consultant and the environmental coordinator. In 2017, a sustainable UN 2030 document was produced, which was later approved. And as many of you now know, there, there is a task force, which is the center of the governance structure at UN. How does UM signature look? In contrast to the other cases, when we applied the tool to UM, an unprecedented level of complexity emerged and a lack of discernment appeared. No clear strategy seemed yet to exist. However, several key assets are present at UM, which could later be developed. Transformative agency, for example, sustainability competence training, organizational action research, and strategic trajectory liaison and learning. My last slide. What can we say after all is said and done? The capacity for transformation requires adopting a culture of experimentation and organizational learning, which should of course come naturally to the university. Universities that undertake an open inquiry into their own workings seem to also trigger pathways to sustainability in their regional environments by leveraging the transdisciplinary knowledge that they produce. They develop competencies that enable them to improve their surrounding communities and society exactly because they have striven to attain a greater depth of sustainability intrinsically. Imagine the ripples of a stone dropping into a pond. We observe the splash, but we cannot see the complexity of effects and influence of ripples and knock-ons that would actually demonstrate impact on regional development or transformation for sustainability. This metaphor helps delimit the inquiry and marks the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Dear candidate, thank you for your presentation. The opposition will now be opened by uh, the chair of the assessment uh, committee, Professor Gijzelaars, who is a professor of educational research at our university here in Maastricht. You're welcome. <laughs> I'm going to change my seat. <laughs> Their candidate, changing his seat not only offers me the opportunity to change my perspective on you. <clears throat> so I would like to congratulate first of all with your very impressive work in a literal way. And I was positively surprised when I received your PhD manuscript because it's so different from anything what I have seen in my department, for example on the classic empirical work, which are so carved out nowadays and cut to the bone studies. And what I really enjoyed was that you tried to develop a comprehensive approach and to cover every detail which you consider to be important. However, I'm not paid today to give you only praise. I'm here, they pay me today to give you a lot of critique and question you about your work. So let's give it a try. Now, I felt your, your work is really ambitious in the sense that you want to understand what makes university make a transition, yes or no. And I was wondering, you needed to make many, many choices in framing your, your uh, research. And normally, it was my tradition in my background in social sciences, in the end, it always comes down to making three kinds of decisions. The first one is the time frame you're doing your research within. 
The second one is your choice of measures. The third is your sampling strategy. You need the subjects and you need to decide at which level you're going to uh, sample. Is it the individual? Is it a unit? Is it an organization? Or is it a set of organizations? And when I was reading your thesis, I noted that I got more and more confused at some moments because on one hand, you are saying you're using a qualitative data analysis and all your work is framed in action research and qualitative analysis, yet your language breezes the positive brave framework of doing the classic empiricist work on causality. And I'm quoting you on developing a methodological strategy of plausibility probe. That made me wonder at the first level, your sampling strategy. You're selecting four universities, and I don't know why you selected them, because the sampling implies that you can make generalizable statements, and that's not justified in your thesis. So it might be that your findings were just by findings by sheer luck. You are lucky to have those four beautiful universities. So I want to know, what's your idea? What's your methodological idea behind your, uh, your sampling strategy? That's the first one. The second one is many PhDs underestimate that the sampling basically drives their conclusions. And that depending on the sampling strategy, you get what you may have been looking for or you underestimated the, what your sampling does. And I'm quoting you literally, where you're saying in chapter seven, the question arose in one in anonymous interview as to whether they, you are referring to the university, they just want an innovative approach to university conduct to attract students. So what you're saying is this university is having a green policy because that pays well, you get more students. Now, I thought, wow, that's a great conclusion. However, your conclusion is based on two interviews and the observation of a research assistant. And that makes me wonder, please could you give me an explanation how your sampling based on two persons with the observation of resources brings you to that kind of very outspoken conclusion. So two questions, the level of the university, how did you get to those universities and why? And the second is, why is your language a causal language while you're using a qualitative uh, research approach. Highly esteemed opponent, thank you very much for your questions. I will attempt to answer them for you. The first question on my methodological strategy of sampling size, I think I could open my attempt on answering that by sharing quite candidly that I learned as I proceeded. Indeed, at the first, in the first phase of my PhD, I was adopting language and strategies from the courses I was taking, Moses and Knudsen, for example, the plausibility probe. My idea was to try my strategy out here in Maastricht before I set out on the case studies. However, as I discovered at each case study, my understanding of how to do this kind of research also moved along. And I can only share that the challenge of doing, of, of explaining how that proceeds is, is quite challenging, but the sampling size was fixed at the beginning. I had selective criteria for each of the three external case studies, whether they had sustainability in the reports on the website, whether they had a sustainability unit like structure, what kind of interconnectivity existed in the structures, and it was a list of approximately 18 criteria. I deduced that list from other literature, a longer list of potential case studies. And I arrived at Loifana, Arizona and Hong Kong, admittedly as a result of, com of a combination of that and which ones seemed to interest me the most. And at that moment, I couldn't, if you were to have asked me what interests you about these case studies, I couldn't have answered you in a way that would have been academic, let's say. However, what I later learned is that it wasn't by pure chance that I selected these universities because they were also very active and they were making noises about their sustainability activities and therefore they were more present online. And because my criteria were designed as such, I, they stood out to me. 
That's still first question. If I can recap your second question so that I've understood it correctly. You're asking why my language is more causal? It's causal and also given uh, your claim for causality, it's, your conclusions are based on two interviews and the observation of a research assistant. I see. And it's quite an outspoken conclusion. You're saying the university does it just because they want to have some more students. If I would have been the executive board of that particular university, I wouldn't be that happy. Indeed. Because it implies if you would have spoken to two other persons who would have said the opposite, you would have drawn the opposite conclusion. And I'm not sure whether that was what you intend to say. Precisely. That wasn't what I was intending to say from that statement. It was more of a, an observation, as I presented in the, the detailed analysis, of the way the sustainability coordinator was trying to convince me not to see this in a negative way. That being able to attract students as the ends to the means of having an effective sustainability policy isn't necessarily a bad thing. And he was convincing me of that. And that's why I, I highlighted that mind map mm -hmm. underneath that rubric. And that's why I reflected on it in the conclusions. Admittedly, it's probably something which more should have been in the discussion. So you would agree with me that this, you were running a risk of over-interpretation in that particular case? Potentially. Okay, thank you very much. Very well. Um, the opposition will be continued by uh, Professor Lang, uh, who is also a member of the assessment committee and a professor of transdisciplinary sustainability research at the University of Lüneburg. And he is visible on the screen over here, and I see now also over there for the audience. Very so good. I hope you can hear me. Yes. Good. I can hear myself, so I, 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 you can probably also hear me. Um, thanks a lot for this for this presentation and and for the thesis, and and I can only echo what what has been said before. It, it, it's impressive. It's impressive what you have done. Um, three big parts, a huge um, body of literature you have drawn upon, interesting case studies, and then action research. So um, first of all, congratulations to this to this work. Um, with regards to my question, let me let me build on the upon the, the the previous the previous question, which in my perspective, you know, related also to the validity of of the of your research um, and also the validity of of the of the um, diagnostic tool that you have developed and the framework that you have developed. And I wanna, I wanna explore on two aspects of, of, the, of the framework. The first one is um, the question of sufficiency, because as I said, you, it, it's, it's really a huge body of, of, of theories, concepts you're drawing upon. And at the end of the day, uh, you, it's also a very, clear structure with the different levels and and the, the different perspectives but at the end of the day you you then end up with um certain criteria or certain um, guiding questions that, that that are in the the diagnostic framework and to me when reading the the thesis is what it was not always clear why exactly those and and then the 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 question you know is on the one hand side why exactly those how you have you selected what is in and what is out, and this, the the second aspect that I would be interested in is really um, how would you consider sufficiency? You know, is it sufficient the aspects you're considering to really get the sense of the of the of the transformative potential and the transformation pathways that you are describing? And what is the criteria that you would argue? Well, this is sufficient um, to really to really assess it. And the second part is, is kind of then, and if, if you have time, you might also want to explore on, on this one, because then it's validity, we have sufficiency, and the question of reliability. What do you think what would, have, would have happened if somebody else would have done the, the, the interviews? Would, would they have come to the same results? Highly esteemed opponent, thank you very much for your questions. Uh, just trying to digest them. Your first question concerns why exactly these criteria in, in the tool, is that is that right? Okay. Your second question is, how would I consider the aspect of sufficiency? 
Yes, and then your third question is concerning replicability. What would somebody else in my position have drawn? Okay, thank you. Um, if I could, I will answer your first question with a how question, which is how I came to those criteria. And there was a process and there was a diagram which I was going to include in this presentation, but I didn't want to overbear. It's in chapter four, the operationalization process that I followed. So I deduced these core elements of organizational transformation for sustainability, 33 that operated at each level. And they were a distillation of the five perspectives that I researched. How can I put this? They, but the theories seemed to cluster together. They seemed to cohere. They seemed to be describing the same phenomena from different angles and also at different scales. So using the, the, the lens of interpretation that I have as an analyst, which may have been different from someone from somebody else's, I clustered them in that way. And I think that is also how I would answer the third question, if you'll allow me to answer that next. The question of reproducibility, replicability, I, I am aware of the fact that that might be the, the weakest part of, of my PhD thesis because it's also highly subjective. I was Im embedded in the inquiry. I was making decisions with regards to the research process, which, which relied on my own psychology, my personality, and how I was interacting with all stakeholders here in a, each case study. I was very involved and perhaps that can be debated as to how wise that would have been. But in, as a result of being that involved, I was let in, I, I was hosted, I was, things came out of these interviews, which I believe can't really be encapsulated in, in only academic terms. There was more under the surface and I was always striving to collect and, and to share that experience because the experience was valuable for how to navigate systemic change. And then the question of sufficiency. In my opinion, the way I did the research was actually not sufficient. I would have preferred to have done a survey at each case study. I would have preferred to have stayed there longer. I would have preferred to have had a research team, perhaps three PhDs uh, doing such a, an inquiry that might have been wiser. And I think that's how I will conclude answering your questions. I hope, I hope I've done a right at that. Thank you. Thank you for answering. Adequately answers the question. Yeah, yes, the, the, the sufficiency also related, but, but I, I think that you, 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 you answered it with regards to the, to the research process. I, would, I was also interested in the, in the diagnostic tool, you know, the, the criteria you have in the tool, if you think they are sufficient and how would you argue that they, that they are sufficient or how do you cope with, you know, this, this idea that we, we need to create models that are complex enough to really get the entire perspective, but that they are still simple enough that we can really apply them. I would say it's insufficient to the extent that it needs to be used and each time it's used, it needs to be refined. And in so far as that through its application, the criteria are refined. What I noticed also was that the extent to which I had to refine them diminished as I was proceeding through the case studies. And that uh, enabled me to be more confident in my application of the tool for Maastricht University, which at, at, at one point I actually doubted whether I should. But because of that process, I was confident enough to be able to stand behind these independent, these descriptors of more or less independent or interdependent qualities in the system. And I, I will attempt to take this tool further and I, I, I'm trying to validate it in my work currently, actually. Do I still have time for, for, for a tiny, Very tiny, tiny, tiny. Oh, okay, because this is, you know, with regards, just, just as a, just out of, out of curiosity, you, and I, I've, I'm fully aware that, um, you know, that it is your tool, but is, is the goal of the tool, as far as I understood, is that it's also, that it's also applicable by others. Is this correct? 
it should be more accessible. I, I, I will be producing, you may have noticed actually in an earlier version of the thesis, there was a codex. I, I took that codex out and I'm gonna make that more accessible with other transitions researchers. Thanks, I'm done. Thank you. Um, so the uh, opposition will be continued now by Professor Zande, who is also a member of the assessment committee and the Professor of Sustainable Organization Development at the Nijerode Business University in the Netherlands. Thank you. Please take the floor. Thanks. Uh, dear candidates, also from my side, uh, congratulations with a timely, impressive and courageous dissertation. Um, since I read your work last year for the first time, or that was in April for the first time, uh, transformative has become a buzzword in academia. Um, so maybe you were a little bit ahead of the curve, but we talk about transformative education, transformative business goals, it's all around. Um, so that's, that's really great. And I think your work is also courageous, um, even though it was a really cumbersome read, I must admit. <laughs> It was also inspiring and thought provoking because I think it's very personal. It has a personal touch and it shows sometimes in what's not said, also a clear commitment to help save our world. So thank you for that. Um, let me join the others in asking you some questions. And um, my first question is around uh, what you call post-normal research for world betterment not postmodern, but post-normal research um, together with sustainability science. Um, in, in, in your work, you quote quite often uh, Hilary Bradbury, who is one of the renowned action research experts in this world at the moment. Um, so I think she was inspirational for you. Um, and you even start with her, a quote of hers that basically says that um, avoiding catastrophes such as climate change, uh, now requires questioning the very nature of the way we produce and use knowledge, uh, which I think you pick up as a plea for the co-creation of what I would also call new knowledge and new forms of knowing. Um, now assume that you would meet Hillary in a conference or so, and you have only a minute or two perhaps to tell her what you think is your main contribution to knowledge and knowing in response to her plea. What would you say? What would you tell her? Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your question. Indeed, a challenging one. What would I say if I met Hillary Bradbury at a conference? I would say that I confronted the limits of the shape and form of scientific knowledge as it exists in the preceding institutional model and culture of the university, that I struggled with it, that I, that I wrestled with it. I tried to figure out a way of bringing the way of describing the phenomena I was seeing from beyond that limit into the, the PhD thesis. And I think the, the result was that it became rather cumbersome because I was trying hard to describe what I was seeing. And I was aware that what I was seeing sometimes could not even be described in the, the terms I was reading in the literature, and perhaps it, it shouldn't be. And that's what was inspiring to me from, from Hillary's approach, also from Colton and Branick's, and from your own. And once you adopt this more appreciative inquiry, and this look at the positive assets in the system, what I would say to Hillary is that I sampled both approaches. I made mistakes first. I was perhaps too in too much in that fight mode in inverted commas, and I forgot about appreciating what was there. But now having come back and returned and being in touch with the stakeholders currently, I am seeing a completely different thing now. And I, I think that's the other side. And I, I, I keep meeting people who are doing this and set examples for doing so. And I would thank her for her inspiration. And I would say that there are more and more people following her example and, and that we need to find new ways, new descriptors and, and have more conferences about this, preferably online. Okay, yeah, well, you, you can probably join her somewhere. But, but so basically what you would tell her is that what she's writing about 
uh, you lived and experienced, and, and from what I hear you say also, there, you know, there's uh, some appreciative sides to it, but it's also a bit of a struggle, right? But, but maybe uh, you're a little bit shy about your own contribution, because I think uh, that you did do extensive action research um, in, in Maastricht. It's the part that is actually remarkably kept out mostly out of the dissertation. Um, so I, I, I actually want you to open that black box a little bit. Um, if you think about wanting to uh, make a contribution to new knowledge, new knowing for a better world, and you look at the, all the, the, the unfolding process of your action research, that, uh, you know, it was a couple of years, and there's all kinds of uh, examples. What would be for you a pivotal moment or a pivotal um, uh, action research activity that exemplifies either the creation of new knowledge and or the creation of new knowing in your own practice? What is there that we can learn? Just take one example, open the black box a little bit for us. One example from your own practice that you say, yes, that felt like I was onto something. And a particular experience which I have in mind in order to answer your question. And I, I had it on the front cover of my early case study reports. And it was, uh, it occurred in one of my interviews with one of my anonymous interviewers, and he was talking about the, the red and the blue pill from the Matrix. I'm not sure how many of you have seen that movie, but taking the blue pill, it, it's Huxley and you take it and you go back to sleep and the red pill wakes you up and you have to confront the cold hard truth of exactly what's in front of you. And I think that's what I take away through, through pushing me to answer this question. What I realize is that emotions matter mm -hmm. and that we need to make more space for them in, in how we research these pro processes because there is a clear link, a clear link to mental health in all this research. And that is the cost of the wrong kind of transformation. It is the qualitative nature of transformation that I believe I unlocked and how to describe the right kinds of transformation, a therapeutic transformation in the same way that a psycho psychotherapist works with a patient. I believe there is a form of science that is perhaps on its way to becoming where you can, it's one of my um, propositions for a reason, where you can diagnose and work with an organization as a therapist, but then you need a team, you need units, and it's not just your research anymore. It's not mm -hmm. my tool. Mm -hmm. It's a collection mm -hmm. of what other people have said. May I press you there? I don't know whether it's time, but, but, but action research is about studying the change that you facilitate. So when did you facilitate such a therapeutic session, for instance? You have an example. Like you were facilitating something that you would now recognize as a therapeutic healing session for yourself and, and for those who were in the room. I'm not sure how much of a good job I did, but in, in 20, Don't be shy. 2017 or so, uh, tw late 2017, 2018, when the, the, the Green Office at the time were fairly demoralized actually about how the, the new governance structure was shaping up and um, they felt they had been completely overlooked and excluded and I felt the same. Uh, we went on a retreat, uh, as we often did as a green office, and that was the, the core of my action inquiry were these retreats. I, I learned a lot from them, and in this retreat, we were focusing on what we could take away from this and, and, and what the, the, the ring-fencing ring policy should be for the green office and what we needed to do uh, with what we had in, in control. We organized a meeting with uh, my co-supervisor and uh, some positivity was instilled and that seemed to help at the time but in the long term it diminished and my my ability my capacity to encourage that kind of process also diminished unfortunately yeah well, so that's one is, example thanks thank you for sharing that and for being honest about it and that could open a completely new conversation but i think i'm running out of time if there's a second round, I want to hear more about your uh, perspective on, on, on appreciative, appreciative inquiry. So we can continue the conversation later, but I now want to give space to other people to ask questions. Thank you. Very well, let's uh, continue then uh, for this moment, uh, the opposition. 
with uh, the last member of the assessment committee, Professor Deckers, who is the uh, professor of liberal arts and sciences education here at Maastricht University. Thank you. Dear candidate, I too would like to offer my congratulations on a wonderful and extensive piece of research. I'd also like to thank you for the contribution that you made to transforming this university to being more sustainable. And in particular, for the contribution you made to the education of many students who were involved with these efforts. For better or for worse, uh, these efforts are the stuff of legends and will live, if not in infamy, then they at least they will live. I also have a question about a, a theme that I think is implicit in your research, but never quite bubbles up to the surface. It occurs to me that at least three of your case studies uh, pertain to universities that in some way subscribe to liberal education. Um, the Green Office, of course, is intimately linked to University College Maastricht. Um, Leuphana University, with its Leuphana semester and its complementary studies program, uh, also adopts something of a liberal education philosophy. And Arizona State University, being an American university, also falls, in some senses, in that tradition. And so I wonder if that is a coincidence, and if you feel that there is a link between liberal education, sustainability, and transition. Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your very interesting question. I believe so, actually. I was uh, prompted to, to watch your, your professorship and there was a video of uh, it being, and you invited your students up in testimonials and I wrote three pages of notes on it because it triggered me so and I believe that's why like that backs up what I found because with this liberal in the sense of the possibility space I said it in German in the book because perhaps that's the, the better way of saying it and that's also how Leifana described itself but you create possibility possibilities for this bottom-up process which occurs through education and training sometimes in informal spaces to take place and that what I observed was the balance in the institutional leadership, allowing that balance, the bottom up, the middle out, and the top down. And universities that do that balance well seem to be able to navigate transformations more effectively. But if I may, that is not a defining characteristic of, of liberal education. That is simply a characteristic of good management. <laughs> Are there any elements in, in the liberal education that you've encountered in these three circumstances that you feel promote uh, this kind of transition, whether it's the academic community, the, um, the pedagogy, the curriculum, the multidisciplinarity. I see, okay. I believe the elements uh, exist in, in the ID tool. Several of them are, are about transdisciplinary research. So several of them are about asset-based community development, taking students out into the field working with stakeholders, learning in research process, projects. However, I would place an injunction beneath my answer in that I don't feel wholly qualified uh, to answer it because I didn't research liberal education itself. It's something that occurred to me afterwards. That the elements seem to also correspond with Bikadal's um, sustainability competencies, anticipatory, anticipatory thinking, complex systems thinking, the deliberative aspect uh, that is inherent to the problem and challenge-based learning approach. I feel all these approaches in terms of pedagogy and didactics are, are very promising and, and perhaps have come from uh, the liberal education programs, but I, I, I probably would have to do more research before I could conclude that further. Thank you very much. The uh, opposition will now be uh, continued by Professor Wilderom, who is a professor of change management and organizational behavior at the University of Twente. 
Indeed, uh, dear candidates, I would like to congratulate you with your big book with a big and important scope uh, and, and especially a very daring set of methods that you've used. And I'm going to ask you a uh, perhaps unusual question, a practical implication type of question, because uh, even though you, you put a lot of practical insight into your book, in the end, I found a number of practical implications missing. And that's what prompted my uh, question. Now, in, uh, I will uh, introduce my question, uh, of course. Um, in my view, a greening organizations like universities is a kind of organizational ideology. Just like, for instance, lean and agile, which have proven their world, uh, their worth worthwhile. Uh, worldwide, wide, worldwide, sorry. <laughs> and uh, one of the major differences between agile, uh, lean, and green is the fact that agile and lean may have or have many proven uh, methods or tools to do it in practice, like Scrum and Kaizen. And the danger with green, I foresee is a lack of very well-developed operational tools. Uh, I do not mean diagnostic evaluative type tools that you used in your research, but well-developed tools to simply do something on the work uh, on the work floor um, with more or less guaranteed greener impact. Analogous to using the Kaizen tool very well in lean efforts. Now, Toyota and other lean experts took a very long time to carefully develop further, uh, for instance, the Kaizen uh, methods for problem solving. And recently, uh, we published even something to refine the process of Kaizen. So there's a very long gestation period of developing tools, uh, lean tools. And even though I am a member of, of, of guiding committees, uh, guiding PC students on greening organizations, uh, in the absence of forward uh, forming practical tools, um, to me is a bit of a sobering fact. And in my view, a hurdle to a real um, process of greening organizations, that the absence of you know, well-developed operational tools in practice. So, so uh, my question is, um, to what extent you would agree with me or, um, you know, in general, uh, your reactions uh, to this uh, point. Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your question. If I might uh, recap your question based on your observation of the missing practical implications in my, my research, or you're looking for the implications of, of what can I draw out of in terms of lack, uh, in terms of well-developed tools which stakeholders could use in order to green their university. Is that right? Or should, am yes. I missing something? At the, at the, at the operational uh, workflow level. Okay. How do I describe this? There are rub the rubrics in the tool themselves have tools within them. And the, the theories are constructed around some of these tools. So for example, Timothy Moen's uh, approach to materiality, you know, the, the matrix that he used to, to organize stakeholders' interests and influence and how to refine a long list of environmental, social, and governance indicators into a shorter list in such a workshop. I performed that with the Green Office in 2014, in 2015, and in several other forums after that, and I found that very useful. I also found other tools in, in the framework useful. So in, in a way, I could say that the practical implications are embedded within the tool. It is, it is a met meta tool in a way. A meta tool, so If you yes. zoom in on a particular, yeah. A meta tool does not, does not mean that it's a tool that we could use as a group of people on the work floor to green a particular part of the organization yet. Okay, I think I see. Right, so the, the tool itself, the tool I developed, probably isn't is something I could hand over to somebody and go, let, let's, let's work on this together. It's something that I think 
sustainability scientists or, or people who are trained to guide processes like this need to, to do to help them because you need to zoom in on what's useful for them. And that can vary depending on what their problem is. So the, the tool I developed is, to, to summarize my answer, is perhaps not a practical tool for the factory floor, but it, it helps you zoom in on which more focused tools, more practical tools underneath each of the perspectives at each scale could help the leadership in the university, could help the students, could help a particular stakeholder group with a particular problem. Well, I, I, I was looking for tools in the end that, you know, irrespective of you as the researcher or is irrespective of any researcher uh, with uh, maybe a consultant could really use so that greening is within reach of a number of, of people in any type of organization. Uh, and, and so, and I didn't find that yet. When I said sustainability scientists, I, I should have also included, they, they don't have to be scientists, but perhaps process facilitation is a, is a better way of describing that, that they need to help facilitate the process, that they're not the user of the tool. And I think it's important to include somebody who can guide the stakeholders. And that's uh, an approach I took. I didn't draw my references to lean from nowhere. I, I went to Stockholm, uh, in between my study in Lofana and I participated in a, a lean startup training with Andy Cars, and he taught me a way of interviewing stakeholders to get to their pain points. And that was a practical tool that I sampled as a researcher from more from the perspective as a consultant because I was surrounded in the room by uh, startup entrepreneurs and I saw how effective it was and I tried to bring that into my research. And I think there's this cross-fertilization where researchers can go out into the field into arenas where they're not usually meant to be perhaps. And the, the tools resemble each other, I think. And, and perhaps that's the limit of what I could say that I did. But I, I did see some resemblance between lean and agile and, and green, and perhaps that's not the most qualified answer. But for me, it, they, they seem to be trying to encourage the same kind of process. Yeah. So in other words, you use a lot of uh, existing techniques and tools for reaching green goals. And I, I'm, my point was, it would be great to have a number of highly specific tools that if you apply them well to certain specified situation, green results would automatically come out of it. Uh, actual green results, not talking about green results, but actual green results. Uh, uh, and, and I would assume that they are slightly different than the existing tools and techniques for process facilitation or agile or, or lean. Uh, I hope I can work yeah. that out after the dust has settled and I, I look forward to trying to develop such tools. Thank you for the recommendation. Okay, let's uh, continue the uh, opposition now with uh, Professor Haag, who is a professor of foreign policy analysis and transatlantic relations here at Maastricht University. Yeah. Is that also not working? <laughs> I'm not sure if, uh, okay, yes, it's maybe easier. We can switch, maybe. Uh, maybe we need to work on more than sustainability, but also effective, yes. Yes, dear candidates, I would like to add my, uh, with my esteemed colleagues, that you have to do something with impressive oversight of the various theoretical, practical, and epistemological epistemological, that's a hard word, yeah. um, that involves in understanding how complex organizations like universities transform to be more sustainable. And I have to say, I also very much appreciated the poetry that you put into your book, especially the two Shelley poems that you have, uh, because you know the first thing I asked you, when I met you actually out in front of this building, I asked you, were you related to the Shelley? And you told me yes, which I think is a very nice thing. But I'm not an expert on this topic, and I think my title makes that clear. And, and I know all the people preceding me have much more expertise in this than I do. And the, and the, the last question was really with the behavioral organizations. I don't have those sorts of ex expertise. But I am an academic who sincerely wants to help regenerate our damaged world. And I'm also an academic who has tried 
to make change within my own institution, for example, where I also first met you in our running for and being elected to the University Council here at Moscow University. Um, and I also know that you are a committed academic and you want to make purposeful organizational change because when I wanted to have some input on the many policy memos that I wrote when I was on the University Council, uh, you were a co-conceiver and you were also a co-proposal writer and I thank you for that. But knowing these things about your background and character, I can see, and I read it, your frustration and your disappointment in realizing that Mastic University's performance did not match the success of the other three institutions in your case analyses. That the 33 rubrics that you have put up for us today that you identified, they were not nearly as developed at Mastic University as they, they were at the other ones, at the other institutions you looked at. Nevertheless, at the end of your work, I think it was in chapter nine and then 10, you do see hope and potential for Mastic University to develop in the right direction. And in chapter 10, you have indeed specific recommendations for the executive board, for the green office, but I want to echo a little bit to what my predecessor argued. I wondered if you could relate these recommendations to the individual level, uh, which brings me to my question. As this academic working at Moscow University, as a person who deeply cares about our planet, in this brittle system that you talked about at Moscow University, can you give me, let's say, your best recommendation to be a transformative agent. It's one of the, the key things that you talk about in your, in your work. You also talk about intrapreneur. So I'm an entrepreneur because I'm inside the university. How do I, how am, how do I act as an entrepreneur from Austin University? And then I learned a new word reading your thesis, syntony. I did not know that word before. How do I live in syntony while I'm working and living on this planet, or maybe I could say, asking your 33 tangible systemic rubrics that you had, which one do I start with and which one would have the most impact? Thank you. Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your question and your cheeky reference to the poet. Um, cool, difficult question. My best recommendation to an academic working in a brittle system, striving for positive change. My answer is contained in the meaning of the word agency, but also in its connection to structure and process, as uh, Anthony Goodens put out. But in, in my mind, I connect that with Aaron's theory of praxis, uh, the praxis of applying theory on the factory floor with a specific set of values behind you. This inherent capacity behind being human, uh, it's referred to as safe spaces, it's referred to as a number of different things where the magic happens. And you can't properly encapsulate that in the, the, the somewhat sometimes uh, brittle and inflexible rubrics that some academic theories impart to us. What I would say is that your instincts I have this conviction that instincts are rooted in what you have learned, that your emotions are there for a reason, that they perform a function, and that through my own experience of becoming an academic, which this ceremony symbolizes, there needs to be a conversation about what is expected to be a new kind of academic, to be a new kind of teacher, to be a new kind of transformative agent, and it is contained in how entrepreneurship is defined. You challenge suboptimal practices. It's immensely difficult, but you see them directly in front of you. You're working within an institutional structure. You're already there. There are constraints. There, are, there is a dynamic balance of power and interest, but you are, you are still there and the system will try and isolate you. And it's not one person acting on you. It's, it, it's a system which is designed to isolate us and designed to, for us to, occlude our emotional meaning 
to include what we bring into the process from our instincts, from what we have learned. And so try and remember what it was like to be a student, try and remember what that was like, and then place the existing conditions, the climate crisis, Corona, the jobs market, the housing crisis. And, and that's how I would finish this answer because perhaps I'm becoming a bit too uh, empathy, empathy, I would say, empathy. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Everybody back in the seat again. Okay. Full change. So we have uh, time, I think, for uh, one more question. So uh, for that, I would like to ask Professor Lang on the online uh, part of the uh, the Corona to ask his uh, question. <laughs> okay. Um, thanks a lot. Um, you already started to explore um, on on the question I. I, I would I would really like to like to ask is the you know what what is the dis the discrepancy we we see in the world and I think we see in universities etc and then you're nicely exploring this is you know we have on the one hand side the urgency of the problems we are facing and on the other hand side we have and and I think you nicely just dis describe this um, and and also exploring it in your action research you know particularly if it comes from the bottom uh, from the from the bottom up, the the slowliness, the traps of the of the processes that are needed to have kind of the fundamental changes, and you then also talk about um, about you know that that you try to identify the the leverage points to really you know work with this uh, discrepancy. And uh, my last question is really, um, what would you say? How can we really where is the leverage that we, you know, that we that we finally manage to to get out of this out of this trap and really um, meet the urgency um, with the necessary bottom up processes that that we have? Highly esteemed opponent, what a wonderful question with which to end the ceremony. I would precisely answer it with my attempt to remember Danella Meadows' words which were that we have to profoundly, madly, and powerfully let go of the paradigms which so sweetly shape our worldviews. And that is the deepest leverage point. Dear candidate, please quickly and briefly uh, finish your answer to the last question. In the leverage points framework, that was the deepest uh, level which she described. And that paper, I would recommend everybody to read that, by the way, from the Sustainability Institute, 1999. Read that last paragraph. It's so powerful. And I think it was also connected to the way I was trying to answer your question about my, my best recommendation. It's not something you can program. It's something that you, you have to realize through going through the process yourself. In an imperfect attempt to answer your question. Thank you. <clears throat> Alexander Baker, the time appointed for defending your thesis has now passed. The degree committee will withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and your defense. I request that you and your company here uh, um, collected uh, await the results of our deliberation and in return uh, and I'll return to this room.
Como auto? Passes or not? Um, and then uh, we will shortly stay in here, uh, the candidate and the opponents, um, to take some pictures also with the opponents online. You will then, you will before this, you will be asked to leave. And we would ask you to directly already go to Cafe Forum for the reception. And then a few moments after, the candidate, the paronyms, uh, probably also the wife, we will follow you and come there for the drinks and for the reception. Jared here and Mel, uh, they will be so kind to lead the way in case you don't know where Cafe Forum is. So just go outside, wait shortly for a moment for the, for the beardy guy and just follow the beard to the drinks and we will um, join you shortly thereafter. Thank you. Thank you. 
<laughs> it sounded like a <laughs> Thank you. 
But I think that would be fair because the, uh, the question that Daniela was asking can only be answered by herself. I can't answer that. The questions that Daniela was asking can only be answered by her because she's the reason why I'm looking at it. Oh, they're back. Dear candidate, dear Alexander, the degree committee here present has assessed the quality of your thesis and your defense. In view of its positive verdict and taking into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. Professor Martens is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in, according, uh, in accordance with Dutch university customs. I invite your supervisor to now take the floor. Do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible? Yes, certainly. Then by the authority vested in us by law, and in conformity with the decision of a committee here present, I hereby confer upon you, Alexander Baker, the degree of doctor and grant you all the rights attached by custom and law. As evidence of this, I now present to you the degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary, and the other members of the committee and affixed with the official seal of the university. Dear Dr. Baker Fleecing, dear Alex, you can't imagine how proud I, am, proud I am to be here today. This is the end of a long journey and a continuation and maybe even the start of many other journeys. That truly is something that characterizes you, Alex. 
you're always involved in many different things. And that is shown too by the many diverse topics that you address in the 568 pages of your thesis. As you state in your postscript, and here I have to take a deep breath to manage to say this all, this thesis presents a bewildering array of theories, perspectives, practices, angles, empirical findings and interpretations on the nature and practice of organizational transformation for sustainability in universities. Actually, apart from the one doctor's title you obtained today, you have done sufficient reading and research to deserve at least a few additional bachelor or master diplomas. <laughs> and let's be honest, without this possibility to engage in many different topics at many different scale levels, you would never have applied for this position back in 2013. An additional attraction for you was that you would be working with UM's Green Office. This PhD position was co-created between the Green Office and ISIS, now MSI, and co-funded by the Executive Board. A truly unique starting point, but not an easy one, as we discovered along the way. When digging through my archives, I was reminded about the struggle you had to find your position at and with the Green Office. Should you be their mentor or an observer, an activist, a change agent, what exactly was that intangible action research that you were supposed to do? You found your way and in your thesis we see that you were deeply committed to UM's transition to sustainability, not only professionally, but on a personal level too. It was a point when you were demotivated and we feared you would not continue. You took a break and returned with new energy and started your case study research. And with your usual zest, you went off to Lüneburg, Arizona, Hong Kong. While we recommended some restraint in data collection, you took the deep <laughs> dive into each of these pioneering universities and came back with immense amounts of data. And that was when a moment of truth surfaced. What to do with all of those data? Well, a new project was born. I can assure all of you that there is an at least 50 page long codex of organizational transformation for sustainability, which is a complete guide on how to use a diagnostic tool with evidence and theoretical background for each individual indicator. Once that was ready, the daunting task of coding all material of all case studies could start. By the way, did anyone try to caution our young candidate? <laughs> we had numerous discussions about writing in general, Alex, writing in English and academic writing. You have a fondness of flowery language and long, very long sentences. At some points, even my trusted internet sources could not help me anymore in finding out what certain obscure words meant. In the end, Alex, you learn to have mercy on us non-native speakers, and I have definitely acquired new vocabulary. I believe that some terms that were most used between us were deep diving from your side and being concise and to the point from my side. Where I was busy deleting large chunks of text to reach my goal of a concise and to the point thesis, you were busy creating new texts that would do justice to all that you had seen and experienced. In my archives, I found some recent wise words from your side. You said, I think I already have begun to answer the main research questions of the thesis in chapter eight and should therefore better trim material than add it. I could not agree more. In the end, you have coherently presented your findings in this thesis deleted sufficient material for at least one other book, but I would hesitate to use the word concise in this context. Coming back to the journey I referred to at the start, there are numerous people who have traveled part of the way with you. Your extensive acknowledgements show that you have a knack of connecting to people wherever you go. Two important travelers need to, mention, uh, need to be mentioned here too. The first one, is little Pavlov, <laughs> who is also featured on the cover page of your thesis. Whenever the two of you it were in the building, it always took some time before you reached me at the third floor as Pavlov's fan club rushed out to greet him. He's probably become one of the most learned dogs I know. 
And the second traveler is, of course, your wife, Charlie. You got married last year here in Maastricht in the middle of the first lockdown. I see before me an empty market square, lots of sun, a handful of people at a safe distance and a very happy couple exiting the town hall. I hope your life together will become a bit more relaxed after today. Knowing your... <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> Knowing your fondness of quotes, Alex, I want to end with a small quote from my side from Walt Whitman's poem, Song of the Open Road, where he praises traveling the roads of life. A foot and light-hearted, I take to the open road, healthy, free, the world before me, the long brown path before me leading wherever I choose. Henceforth, I ask not good fortune, I myself am good fortune. Henceforth, I whimper no more, postpone no more, need nothing. Done with indoor complaints, libraries, querulous criticisms, strong and content, I travel the open road. Congratulations, Alex, and enjoy traveling your open road. Thank you. The uh, Dr. Baker, also on behalf of the Port of Deeds, I congratulate you with the honor you have just acquired. I hereby close this session. Um, the only thing remaining is that I have uh, to tell a few organizations.